environment, this protracted 25.5 million year caldera cycle in this area, these nested calderas created a, an environment of high geothermal gradient, um, which was going to promote fluid flow. There was uh, this, the, all of these caldera cycles promoted fault movement, tectonic, breccia, uh, tectonic movement, fault breccia, continued movement, and abundant water was supplied by meteoric water, groundwater, and also the saline waters of Lake Creek. Subsurface intrusive activity contributed metals, <coughs> metals and volatiles to the mineralizing system. Now, this created the perfect environment for an epidermal system. Uh, it's kind of the perfect storm, so to, stay, so to speak. Uh, you have a volcanic terrain, structural control conduits for mineralization. You have <coughs> fluid flow of low to moderate salinity fluids, low to moderate temperatures, 240 to 300 degrees C, depositing abundant gain and ore minerals where physiochemical conditions facilitated that. Um, you have alteration that is generally zoned from hot, lower pH to cooler, neutral pH, distal to the system. Now this is a typical epithermal system. Um, these, this would be a fissure vein, veins dominating this district. This is a typical epithermal system model. And what this shows is that from depth and high heat to shallow low heat and laterally away from the conduits, you see zonation of minerals and a zonation of alteration. Now I'm going to show you how the creed mineralization fits into this typical model, and maybe how it doesn't. Um, we'll focus on this area right here, near the town of Creed, and the Alpha Corsair veins, Bulldog vein, and Amethyst veins here in this structurally prepped area. 86 million ounces of production right here. <coughs> if we take this long section right here, and we look from the west to the east, this is a schematic model done by uh, Previous workers published in GSA Ancient Lake Creed book, we modified it a little bit, made the colors a little different, added some of our knowledge and experience. Credit goes to them. But this is the main mining district here in cross section. And you have a hydrothermal system that instead of having a pronounced vertical expression, it has a pronounced lateral expression. This mineral zonation here, um, we'll look at in detail. I'm going to use the bulldog as an example. This is Ancient Lake Creed providing saline recharge meteoric water, and intrusive activity at depth. Using the Bulldog as an example, this would be some detailed structural modeling of the Bulldog system, showing how complicated things are. It's dominated by the A vein on the right, or the east, and the N vein to the left or the west. This is what fissure veins looked like. This is in the Bulldog in 19, about 1969. Um, I'm not going to dwell on that, but what we see here is uh, five stages of mineralization, courtesy of Jeff Plumlee some homestake workers, Stan Caddy and Craig Byington, and these, this progression of mineral stages, these paragenetic sequences, are zoned from north to south. And they're zoned from depth, from deep to, to shallow as well. There's a schematic of that. We see stage one deposited at depth, further fault movement and opening. We see stage two and stage three deposited against the uh, wall of the uh, Cree caldera right here, this extensive native silver, and to the north, where before cooling and oxidation dominated, we saw the deposition of base metals and quartz and fluorite um, So as the system evolved. Similar schematic, south, north to the right, and it just shows relative abundance of, of uh, mineral deposition and ore deposition being to the south, less to the north, and uh, this really reflects the, uh, like I said, the oxidation and cooling of the system and really forcing those metals out of solution. And that is pretty much it for the geology. And now we're going to do a little historic creed improv <coughs> with Ken Wiley. Mm -hmm. yeah. No pun intended. <laughs> I'm going to run this. Okay, my, thank you, Jonathan. My name is Ken Wiley. Most of you know me. I've been here all my life. And I uh, can't seem to find the way out, and that's good. <laughs> I uh, started working at the uh, equity mine basically in the 60s. My dad was a part owner in it, so I had a little experience in the equity when Joe Cox and Bibbs Wiley had that. In 68, 69, I went to work at the Bulldog as a motorman, so I got in on the early exploration development up there. The history of Creed, though, starts way back in the 1890s, actually the 1880s on the Alpha Corsair, but Nicholas C. Creed came here, and of course this is what it looked like 
before there was any civilization. He went right up the canyon to the uh, forks of East and West Willow and on the ridge between, which is called Camel Mountain, and found the Holy Moses Mine. It was high-grade silver, and it's a part of the basic structure, the vein structure, the Holy Moses and the King Solomon up East Willow, which produced lots and lots of silver through the years. He uh, sold that later on, and of course this is the Holy Moses Mine. He sold it for $75,000 to Cheeseman, Smith, Campbell, and the president of the Denver Rio Grande, and uh, went right on down across the canyon over here and staked the Amethyst claim, which is the big smokestacks there in the middle. Now the Amethyst was probably the biggest producer right next to the Chance. When the boom happened, which Creed was behind Leadville, Leadville 30,000, Creed was about 10,000, but 10,000 people came here for a couple of years and it was pretty chaotic. We have a history of some famous people. Uh, Pat Masterson was here as a sheriff for a while and uh, Bob Ford, who killed Jesse James, came here and himself was killed here in Crete. So we have a little history there. So when the Sherman Silver Purchase Act was repealed in the mid-90s, then population started to die, mining died, and uh, by the turn of the century, there's only about a thousand people left in Crete. It was pretty slow, but it, but it hung on. The Reynolds group, Albert Eugene Reynolds, who's famous throughout the state, he had Summitville, and he came to Crete and ran a lot of tunnels and had a lot of mining at the Pittsburgh and the Del Monte and the Commodores. So this is what Creed looked like then. It was starting to build up, get it going. This was North Creed and that's where the influx of people started. Once it overflowed with the 10,000, they moved on downtown and they then called the Upper North Creed. And this was Jimtown originally, but uh, they eventually called it Creed and that's what we call it today. So it was crazy in those days with the gamblers. Soapy Smith was here with his con men in the whole nine yards. And <laughs> Creed was a booming and went crazy for a while. And, and uh, a lot of your relatives were probably here, maybe. So. <laughs> At any rate, floods and fire and the rest took toll on the, on the community. It was pretty harsh. And you can see the upper part of that picture. That was a fire June 5th, 1892. Burned the whole upper part of town, part of the ground. And, they uh, rebuilt after that and found out what bricks were good for. <laughs> Sawmills were abundant everywhere and lots of wood in town to build the structure. So anyway, again, as the Sherman Silver Purchase Act was repealed, no, no mining to the extent of what it had been before. You can see the production stats from the first production in 1891, how it escalated and dropped. That's what this is intended to show. Yeah, I've read of course, I read every book that comes out on it, and then friends of mine like Charles Marshalls, who's in the crowd, who's a literary genius and has read many. Uh, there's a lot of stuff out there, but uh, a lot of money came and went to Creed. And Creed, I read where it was getting $1,000 a week deposited in his bank account in Pueblo at the heyday. Of course, by about 92, he got smart and left town because the work, he'd done all he had to do. He went to L.A., and of course, that's where he passed on. But... Uh, he made a significant amount of money. This is the amethyst mine here, which with the big stacks, the last chance in the upper part. They're the two biggest mines in this, on the amethyst vein about a mile back. This is the amethyst mill. In Dick Houston's book, the first two concentrate mills in the Creek District, well, this was one of them. And uh, prior to that, they were shipping raw tonnage to the smelters in Pueblo and in Leadville. And of course, the cost was, was a, a lot. So. When they finally got these mills going, it really helped them a great deal. Now this is on the amethyst vein up there. The shafts on the amethyst vein are about 1,200 feet deep, getting the last chance, the happy thought on up the canyon. And today you still get in, it's locked up, but the Poxon family still own it. And uh, we get in there with the mine people, uh, state Jeff Graves is here, and the water is what the problem is today, but there's still a few tunnels where you can get in underneath. They go in about three miles, 12 to 1400 foot they mined out, and they were like ants in a big mound. They went crazy for a long time. But the amethyst here, and the the, uh, the mine over John Payne owns over on the East Willow were the first two concentrate mills in the district. So this is an interesting. This is the original photo, and then they hand watercolored it. That was their version of a colored photograph. <laughs> Of course, when the, when the boom hit, there were up to three trains a day coming to 
town, and there were so many people that had to ride on top of the box cars, and of course you could see the platforms bringing all the stuff in. Some of the old Gus Prince and them were still here when Dick Lehman came to town in the late 30s, and uh, he said that, uh, Gus said, oh yeah, when the trains come to town, we all went down to the station to see, you know. And he said, what'd you go down and see how much mine equipment come down? And he said, no, no, we went down to see if there's any more women come to town. Mine <laughs> <laughs> camps were a little sparse in those days. The Nelson Tunnel, of course, Nelson was an engineer and ran the Nelson Tunnel up the canyon up here. It's the lowest tunnel in the project up there. Of course, the, all the water reaches down to that today, and that's where the water comes out, which they're working on. Uh, Nelson went in 2,100 feet, and then they took off of that in later years. Wooster did, and ran a tunnel on back to about 7,000 feet in the Commodores, and then it goes tore on back to the back of the mine where Humphrey ran it. Humphrey came out of Virginia, was in Duluth, Minnesota, mining copper, and he came to Crete in the late 1890s and put in the Humphrey Mill. His uh, tram came out of the top, it's 2,400 feet to the Nelson Tunnel, and his idea was to make uh, available to all the mine companies to bring their ore out, concentrate it in here and put it right on the rail. Now Reynolds didn't like that because Humphrey wanted to charge like a buck and a quarter a, a ton to get the ore out, so he said to heck with you, and he ran his tunnel up there, still there, it's called the Manhattan Tunnel, which nowadays is called the Commodore 5. But uh, Humphrey uh, also has a big ranch on the head of Goose Creek, and, and he, uh, he died in the 20s, I believe it was. But uh, all of these people came in here. A lot of money was made in Crete in those days, as was all the mining camps around. Foxen came to town with Herman Imperius. Foxen was a school teacher from back east, and he came into the San Luis Valley at the, about 1918 or so and got with Herman Imperius, a businessman down there, and they bought from Reynolds. Reynolds died, I believe, in about 21. Uh, so they bought and traded property in Summitville for the Pittsburgh, the Del Monte, the Commodore claims up the canyon, which they still are owner. They own over 500 acres. This is the Amethyst 5 level, so they came in from the shaft down to 5 level because they were going through all the timber in the district to timber the mines and then to burn in the boilers to make the steam to hoist the ore up. So as soon as they could, they started running the tunnels in from down below because then you just pulled it out with horses. This is old Blackie. And these three gentlemen with him, I knew all of them, Tommy Phillips on the left, Byron Beck in the middle, and Harry Larson on the right. Blackie's got a, a battery and a cat lap on because, of course, he was <laughs> pulling four right out of the Ami-5. Mining leaves a legacy. There's just no question about it. I've worked all over the world in mining sites in Eastern Europe and Middle East. Mining leaves a legacy, particularly mining that occurred last century and the century before. It's changed. The mining industry uh, and the mining sector, I have to give them an enormous amount of credit. They have come into the new world with respect to environmental protection. Uh, mining operations now are far, far different than they were 50, 60 years ago. But we have... This is seven. Is it the middle? It should be the middle. Oh, this? No, the pointer. Oh, okay. This just represents uh, piles of solid mine waste, mainly waste rock, a few tailings, small little tailings, uh, piles up in here. But just to give you an idea, within the watershed here, we have quite a, a distribution of solid mine waste, mostly waste rock, but again, major sources of zinc, cadmium, and lead, which are the real critical actors here. This is an aquatic problem, not really a human health problem. It's a, it's a problem in Willow Creek in the Rio Grande. A lot of mines, as we've heard from others about, and this is sort of the resultant legacy, plus the, of course, the notorious draining uh, Nelson Abbott, uh, which account, accounts for a very, very significant portion of the metals load in Little Creek and down to the Rio Grande. So, how did this all begin? In the late 1990s, EPA's site assessment program, part of the Superfund program, uh, that program for years since EPA has been started, kind of goes around, looks at places, that uh, are impacted and goes through a process, a preliminary site assessment, very well defined sort of cookbook process. At the end of that, you get a score, and that score indicates whether or not that particular site may be eligible for the national priorities list or may not. That happened here. And it scored enough for EPA to say, well, man, maybe we want to list this. So uh, we came down here, and uh, we found out very quickly that uh, we could not proceed unilaterally. That just was not going to work. 
Leadville was in its heyday, and for those of you that have been around Leadville, I, I worked there for six years. Things didn't always go smoothly at Leadville. <laughs> Things didn't always go smoothly at the smuggler mine in Aspen. We learned at EPA, the state learned, we all learned how to clean up and deal with legacy mining sites. And believe me, it, it is not simple. It's taken us a while. The learning curve was steep. The good news for Creed is we've gone through a lot of that learning curve by the time we arrived here. So that was good for the town. But I remember coming here and the, the community very concerned about the economic impacts of a listing on this town. And now it's a, it was a bus period because the homestake had left. So what's a listing going to do to a town that's struggling a little bit? And the reputation. You know, if, you, if your reputation is a super fun site, it's not good. So, we listened to that, and uh, Zeke Ward made sure we listened to that, and uh, had many, many discussions with Zeke over the years about this, and it turns out Zeke was right. You know, it was better to go slowly, and it was better to not list, let's just try some other things. So, we decided not to pursue the listing and agreed to work with the community and other stakeholders in a watershed-based approach. And I think that's critical. You've got to put mining districts in the context of watersheds. It's just the way to look at them. They're not a point source. They're a watershed scale operation, and they have impacts throughout a watershed, particularly one, Will Creek's a relatively small watershed. So we decided to do that, put off the listing, took the Superfund people off the project. I came on the project as a non-Superfund person, and we pursued it uh, under Clean Water Act authorities mainly, uh, but through a community-based, stakeholder-driven approach with Willow Creek Reclamation Committee, which had just been formed, being the guiding group of people because it represented all the stakeholders, a very large stakeholder group in the, in the committee. Uh, so that was the principle, and that committee has guided efforts uh, ever since then. A lot of agency involvement right from the get-go. We used Clean Water Act authorities for the first 10 years down here to try and deal with things. Small Clean Water Act grants authorized under various sections of the Clean Water Act. Uh, to deal with solid waste piles, to do things in terms of pulling them back from the streams and capping. And, and uh, deal with some of the things on the floodplain below town. Uh, and obviously CDPHC, <laughs> Division of Wildlife, state agencies were involved. Forest Service was involved. Uh, USDA, so a lot of agency involvement, but again, under the auspices of the Willow Creek Reclamation Committee. We strived and worked very hard to develop a consensus amongst the community and the agencies as to how to proceed. This is our priorities. How do we prioritize these sites? It's all focused on metals loading. What are the areas that put the most metals into the creek? That's really the bottom line, and how do you prioritize those, determine that, and come to a consensus? Uh, we then proceeded over the next few years with both the historical and environmental assessments. And this is an enormous database. We have 15 years worth of environmental data in this watershed. Uh, that's a rare thing. It's an enormous database, data collected by a wide variety of organizations, people, volunteers. Uh, so it's, it's big. And then development of strategies for remediation, restoration, revitalization. All those things go together. And that's a real important point here. You can't do one without the other in a town like this. You have to keep in mind revitalization, the economy, uh, as well as the environmental um, remedial activities. And then to implement these over time in a partnership way, with the community being very engaged. I've always been impressed at the amount of volunteer hours people in this town put out there. It's just staggering to me for a small town. Um, but they've been involved all along the way. Watershed management plan has been developed by the community, I think with a grant from uh, Colorado Department of Health. And then later on, after 2008, we started to use CERCLA, or Superfund authorities, in very innovative ways. Not the sort of traditional come in, list the site, get out of the way, we'll fix it. Uh, there are other ways. CERCLA is a very powerful piece of legislation if you know how to use it. There's a lot of pieces to it, and it's much friendlier than people think. There. Unfortunately, we've seen things get actually substantially worse in Cement Creek, and I'm not going to get into a lot of detail as to how that happened, uh, but it has, and uh, that's kind of where I'm going to lead to about this talk about crowdsourcing, looking for innovative technology. 
The area I'm going to talk a little bit about here is this, this C, this kind of area where the C is up here at the top. We call it Upper Cement Creek. Upper Cement Creek, uh, in the middle here, actually, oh, sorry about that. This area, this is where Upper Cement Creek is, way over here on one side. This is actually outside of the Cement Creek drainage, but this is a, a map looking down at all the mine workings in that area. This is the Sunnyside Mine right here in the middle. Sunnyside Mine was by far the largest mine in uh, the Silverton area. And uh, it was shut down in 1991. As part of their reclamation plan, um, they put bulkheads all around uh, the mine pool, or I'm sorry, the mine workings so that they could be filled up with water. This uh, right here, this purple line, that's the American Tunnel which was the main access to the Sunnyside workings. And there were three bulkheads put into that tunnel. Uh, this, this bulkhead right here backs up water about 1,200 vertical feet. So it has a lot of pressure on that bulkhead. Um, this was part of the reclamation plan uh, that was also done under a consent decree with the state. And uh, over after a number of years, Sunnyside also did a lot of projects throughout the basin to offset any seeps and springs that might occur because of this bulkheading. Uh, they spent probably 20-25 million dollars doing remediation throughout the basin. And right at the end when the consent decree was kind of fi finally signed off on by the state in about 2003 I think it was, we started seeing a lot more drainage coming out of some of these other mines. You know the bulkheads of course backed up the water table <coughs> and yeah, at one point, this tunnel was serving as a drain for the whole mountain. You put a, a plug in that bathtub, it's going to fill up with water, and now we see a lot of drainage coming out of some of these other mines. Uh, that's a little more, that's a, kind of a 3D view of what's going on up there in Upper Cement Creek. Uh, here's the American Tunnel where the bulkheads are. Uh, there's no shafts here. Uh, the tunnels that we see a lot of drainage coming out, there's still some drainage coming out of the American Tunnel, about 120 gallons per minute. Red Benita is about 300 gallons per minute. The Gold King can vary anywhere from 50 to 250, and the Mogul is probably around 80. So these four drainages here are, uh, have unfortunately significantly degraded the Animus River at this point. These uh, diagrams, by the way, these are all done, this modeling was all done by uh, Kirsten Brown, who's here in the audience, and she's got a really nice way. She can pivot and turn and look at this in all different directions. It's quite a nice... Uh, visual aid. Uh, here's the American Tunnel. The tunnel was reclaimed and uh, there's just a pump pipe coming out at this point. Uh, the Mogul Tunnel. I guess just had to give you some pretty pictures. Here's the Gold King, number seven. And the Red Bonita, which is really the poster child for taking pictures for an abandoned mine and an abandoned mine drainage. Uh, this was taken in 2009. You can see the road down below there in a, in a vehicle, so you can kind of get a sense of how, how uh, big that is. There's a picture looking up at it. It's really quite impressive to walk along that road and look at all this water come cascading down over the dump. Uh, since that time, uh, the mine has actually been opened up. Uh, EPA opened it up to look inside to see if some source controls could be done. And uh, DRMS and EPA went in last summer and explored all the mine workings. Uh, the pH has changed a little bit, and as a result, we get a little different uh, precipitation coming out of that mine portal. Uh, there are some, there's thoughts that there may be a bulkhead might be placed into this uh, portal here in the near future, maybe next year. Anyway, well, we've got to a point where we've got 600 plus, 600, 700 gallons per minute pretty nasty acid mine drainage in this area. We think that, that some of that can be reduced through source controls, as Mike suggested earlier. Uh, but we do also think there will eventually have to be some treatment in this area. And everyone knows that line precipitation and high density sludge, which is kind of the uh, industry standard, is very expensive to operate. Um, as somebody else was pointing out earlier, it's very hard to recover the metals. It's too expensive to recover the metals in such a process because you kind of mix them all together. But overall, handling all that sludge and handling all the lime is very expensive. And so we've been looking for ways to try to reduce the cost of treatment. We think it would be beneficial to us, and we think it would be beneficial, of course, to everybody who's involved 
in band of mine issues and in current mine issues. And so as a result, we thought, we, we did a couple things. We've been looking at different technologies. Um, here's a list of some different types of passive technologies. Actually, this list came out of a, a EPA document. EPA just put out in March, kind of listing and explaining a number of different technologies that are kind of out there. This is kind of a list of passive technologies. I'm not going to go through them all. Uh, here's a list of a number of different active technologies. And they all have their pluses and minuses, and some of them work in some certain situations, and some of them don't. Not very many of them work very well when you have a fairly high flow. Uh, a lot of systems don't work very well if you have low, uh, low pH and, and high iron in particular. It tends to clog a lot of things up. So we've been looking for trying to find ways that might reduce the costs. So we thought, well, we'll get a little creative. Oh, there's uh, here's some other uh, listing as uh, ways to treat a mine pool as well. We heard about this uh, website. It's called Innocentive. Actually, Bill Simon, who's one of my co-coordinators, uh, read about this in a book about creative thinking. Innocentive was set up by a pharmaceutical company. The pharmaceutical company was getting tired of they were paying staff to try to develop new drugs. And all the staff was being educated in the same universities, and they all knew each other, and they all kind of approached everything the exact same way. And so uh, this pharmaceutical company said, well, we need to look outside the box. So we're going to set up a website where we're just going to post a problem out there, we're going to post an award, and we're going to see what we get out of it. And, and they were somewhat successful. They did get some kind of outside-the-box thinking, outside-the-box ideas. And over the years, that pharmaceutical company spun off that, so Innocentive is now its own entity, its own website. Uh, there are some other ones out there like it. This one's probably the most extensive. And what you do is, it's, you know, ideally it's very simple. You post a challenge, you put up a, an award. They have about 300,000 result, uh, registered solvers throughout the world. And uh, they can respond if they want. And then you kind of go through what you got in response, and you decide who you might want to make an award to. There are different levels of challenges. They have like an ideation challenge, which is, is kind of a brainstorming challenge. And that's kind of the lowest level, and the, the awards tend to be around $10,000. I should also note, it's expensive. It costs about, they generally, their, their, their set price is $20,000 to post a challenge. Now, they actually gave us a bit of a discount. We didn't, have to come up with that much money. Um, but it's expensive. So there's different types of challenges. The ideation, uh, as I mentioned, was about 10,000. 10, and it's, it's more of you know, a brainstorming session. Just give us your ideas. The theoretical challenge is a little more detailed. It's an, it's an area where you want to give a little more specific criteria, and you're expecting a, quite a bit more in return from people. You know, how does this work? Show us how this works. Show us some data if you've got it. The reduction of practice is even more. That's, that's kind of a challenge. We're expecting people to go out and actually test something and give you some data in return for it. We spent a lot of time trying to figure out what level of challenge we wanted to do. We were kind of going back and forth between the ideation and the theoretical. The problem with the ideation is you get a lot of ideas, but you have no idea whether they're going to work or not. They're hard to evaluate. It's hard to go through a list of these ideas and think, well, this one may work and this one may not if you don't have any data to prove it. And you can ask for cost data, but who knows if it's anywhere, if it's accurate at all. With a theoretical challenge, you can ask for a little more detailed data. And that's helpful, but our concern was that we would limit the ideas that might be out there as well. We were, were concerned that if we just did a theoretical challenge, the people who would respond to it were people who had, were in the business of doing fine remediation and maybe consulting firms, and they had good data and information, but we wouldn't learn any new ideas. We'd just be getting a lot of good information about those previous um, listings that I had up there, but we may or may not actually get something that was really truly new. As I mentioned, we opted for an ideation challenge, which is a, a brainstorming type structure. And we also had to think about, well, what exactly, what does, what, how are you going to write this challenge? Writing a challenge is not easy. And we considered different things. We considered doing a challenge, for example, of 
how would you reduce acid uh, generation within the mine itself? There are things that you could do inside the mine. And we finally decided that that was just too site specific, that the responses we would get, um, you know, they wouldn't apply to a lot of sites. And part of the idea, and part of the idea why we got some funding from these different entities is we wanted to be broad enough that it could apply to a lot of other sites besides just our site. So we ended up kind of making a fairly general challenge, uh, dealing with um, a, a situation like the Animus. You know, this is kind of the water quality we have. It's a narrow mountain valleys, long winters, lots of snow. Settling ponds are kind of challenging up here. Uh, give us your ideas. We got about 260 people that we know looked at it, that they have to kind of sign in to look at the challenge, and 65 submitted responses, and we're currently evaluating those responses. About a dozen of those responses, you know, Senate didn't even send to us because they were so kind of far off and away from our criteria. So we're really looking at about 53. Unfortunately, I don't think anything is a silver bullet. You know, well, that's, that's the thing you're kind of gambling on and trying to find, to see if you can find the silver bullet to find something that's really outside the box. There are definitely some ideas that are different and interesting. We don't know for sure if they'll work very well, uh, but we'd like to see somebody try them. And, and just by reading, just by through the exercise, we are kind of gaining some other ideas. Well, maybe we could take a little bit of this solution and a little bit of that solution. So we haven't quite got to the point of making awards. We'll have to make that decision in the next couple of weeks. 